Happy Sabbath, church family. And welcome to Hinsdale Philam today. How do you like our beautiful weather outside? Man, it is it's gorgeous. It's a little cold, but it's beautiful. At least the sun is is uh, shining and it's clear blue skies. Very, very special time of the year. I want to welcome everyone here. I want to welcome Joel back from Southern. It's good to see him today. And uh, didn't our praise, our worship team, didn't they lift us to heaven today? Man, praise the Lord for that. And uh, it's special when sisters sing together, Mick Mick. And you guys have a special blend. Thank you for leading us to the cross today and to heaven today. I want to ask you to do something for me. If you don't know your neighbor's name by now, would you take 10 seconds, look them in the eye, and make sure you fix that problem? Go for it right now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Okay, very good. Stop, stop, stop. Good, good. Awesome. Thank you. I want to make sure that when we come to church, that it's not just about us. And, uh, and yes, we're here to meet with God, but man, there's a reason why the people around, there are, there's people around you, right? It's connection, it's community, it's friendship, it's relationship. And so today, um, I'm just going to start with uh, saying that on my day off, I really enjoy going to the library. Man, I take an hour, sometimes two, and uh, I get to just have quiet time and just open up some books and uh, some magazines sometimes and just, uh, just randomly read. And I love it. It's quiet. Uh, when you have four kids at home, you'll understand. Uh, so it's good. It's good to get away sometimes. And I found this book this week, A hundred, uh, thou, A Thousand and One Things Your Kids Should Do. And then the, the quotation is, or else they'll never leave home. So I thought, oh, I got to pick that one up. So anyway, so here's a few that I really liked. Number 452, they need to resist temptation when they walk into a mall. Right? That's, that's man, absolutely something that they need to do. Oh, man. Please tell me we're not having problems with this thing again. Next slide. Oh, 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 back, back, back. Okay, how about this one? 604, I love this one. They need to be thankful, especially when it's difficult to be thankful. Amen? They need to dream big, 605. 606, they need to remember that another person may not see a smile all day except through them, which is why I uh, had you turn to your neighbor and smile. And then I love this one, number 88. Wait, no, number 91st. They need to turn off the television. In our day, this is obviously written a long time ago. In our day, they need to turn off their cell phone sometimes. And we do too, parents. <laughs> Number 88, I love. They need to learn how to find their way home. They need to learn how to find their way home. Hinsdale Phil Am, end of this month, we're doing something very special. Something I've never seen before. Um, I've never done before. I've never seen before. I've never heard of before. We are going to invite all of our young adults, and by the way, from, 19, from the ages of 19 to 35, can you believe that there's over 150 young adults listed in our books? And we're inviting all of our young adults to come for a special week of spiritual emphasis. We're going to invite them to come home. Amen? Amen. You guys ready for this? Yeah. There's two things I'm going to ask you to do. Number one, be here to welcome them. They need someone to welcome them, right? They need someone to welcome them and just give them a big hug. If you should see them. But there's a second thing I'm going to ask you to do. And it's this. If you should see them, don't ask them where they've been. And don't comment about their appearance. Just hug them and just welcome them. Are we clear? Yes? Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for anointing this time together. We've already been lifted to your presence as we praised, as we sang, as we prayed, as we called for giving and all these things, as we've talked to each other, as we greeted each other. But Lord, there is something special about these next few minutes when we open up the word of God. Lord, we believe that your word is living and active. And that means that when we receive it, there's something that happens inside of us. It's a mystery. We can't describe it, but it's real. And Lord, I pray that you would once again bless your word, 
that it would go deep into the hearts and minds of your people here today, and that it would be life-changing. Not because I am giving this message, but because your word is so powerful. So please, Lord, hear this prayer. We give you this time now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So PDK last week talked about a subject that was very interesting. He talked about how, um, if you were here, he talked about how sometimes people on the outside view church and how unfortunately sometimes they view church as judgmental. He largely, he largely got those ideas from a book that we read called, um, and it was a required reading um, recently for the, all the pastors. It's called You Lost Me. And why a generation of, of, of young people have left and what they think of church. And it's, it's a, just a wonderful book. And as I was reflecting on that this week, it looks like this, by the way, as I was reflecting like that this week, there's some buzzwords in that book uh, that I wanted to bring out too. And so if you ever read that book, you'll see that these are some, some ways people think of church. They think of church as old-fashioned. They think of church as judgmental. They think of church as boring they think of church as exclusive. And so this makes my theme today even more difficult. And so if this is how people perceive the church, if this is how they're thinking of church, then today's subject, today's theme is a very difficult one. For pray for me, please pray for me. I'm just going to put it out there. When I was growing up, and I, most of you know that I grew up in the church, and uh, I heard all the messages and when I was growing up in church and I was taught this idea of remnant, I was told by very well-meaning people, I should add, and welcome, it's good to see you guys, by very well-meaning people, I should add, that we, the SDA church, we are the remnant. No one else, we are the remnant. That's what I was told. That's, what how, that's how I was taught. Again, very well-meaning people and... and um, Whew. talk about judgmental, talk about exclusive. And it was always hard for me, just to be honest with you guys, man, I don't know if you guys think like that, but I always, it was always a hard pill for me to swallow. I couldn't really accept that because, as I mentioned, I grew up in this church. I grew up in the church, and the people that were telling me they were remnant were often the people that I would look at and I would think, but you're so unchristian. And, and, and I would think about some people in my life, and I've never, never would ever mention them, but I would, uh, their names, but I would think about people in my life like, so you're telling me you're remnant, but, but man, why is it so hard for people around you, including your family, to see Christ in you? And it was so hard for me to swallow, like, how could I, how could, how could I possibly accept that? I, I had a lady in my church who was always pushing us to stop eating cheese. Always stop, always pushing us to stop eating meat, always pushing us to stop singing new songs in church. But she was so racist. I mean, there's no other way to describe her. And, I, and I, of course, I would never pray for her, by the way. And I, I still do. And, and I, there's no other way to describe her except that she was racist. So I describe her as this. She was a racist, him only singing vegetarian. <laughs> That's how I would describe her. You know how she would describe herself? Remnant. And I would see this. And as I was growing up, and I was, and, and, and 15 years, after 15 years of being in the ministry, I can tell you, just because you're part of a religion doesn't mean you're remnant. Just because you call yourself at a certain title or a certain religion doesn't mean you're remnant. You don't believe me? Put remnant people in a board meeting talking about money and or music. And you'll see what I'm talking about. But that's not here in his the Philam. Amen. Amen. So problem number two. Other churches and other religious sects, S-E-C-T-S, they claim to be remnant. So just because you claim something doesn't mean it's true. So I'm looking at this concept of remnant. And I want to ask you here today, church, as we, stop, as we start this message, I'm going to ask you, to take out anything that you've ever been taught about this subject, everything that's ever been told to you or taught to you, take it all out, because we're just going to look at the Bible here today. Amen? We're going to look at what the Bible has to say about this subject, about the remnant. Is First of all, is there a remnant according to Scripture? 
If so, who are they? And why does this even apply to me? Why does this even matter to me? So those are the three questions we're going to try to tackle here today. Again, let me tell you what they are. They are, is there a remnant in Scripture? Number two, if so, who are they? And number three, why does this even matter today, 2018? Are you guys with me? You guys okay? All right, here we go. Here we go. Let's go to our Bibles. But first, I'm going to give you a definition in the Anchor Bible Dictionary of what remnant is. And I love Auntie Angie's story. I loved it. And by the way, the kids were really paying attention. Auntie Angie is really good. I loved it. It's a very, very good story. The Anchor Bible Dictionary describes remnant as what is left of a community after it undergoes a catastrophe. So it's a community that has survived. It's a community that, uh, is, that remains. Okay? So it's the rest of, of that community. That's the Bible Dictionary definition. So we're going to look at a community. We're going to look for a community. As we look at the Bible, we're going to look for a community that has survived. You think we can find that kind of community in the Bible? Well, man, we don't have to look far at all. We open up the Bible and right in the beginning, we see a community. In fact, we see that word remnant right away in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. And if you look at Genesis chapter 6 and 7, you can, if you're a note taker, please take this down. You can look at it later. But I do have it up there here for you. And the first time we ever see remnant is the story of Noah and his family and the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, God says, I am sorry for what I've created. I'm looking around and everyone is evil and they're just harming each other and they're, they're, they're doing terrible things to each other. And God says to, God says, I'm sorry for that I have made them. But he looks at Noah and his family and he says, what church? He says, but Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. Genesis chapter seven, verse one, the Lord tells Noah, Hey, I want you to take your family, I want you to enter the ark, and uh, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. For you alone, for you guys. What's that word? Remnant. For you are the only remnant. For you, you are the only ones remaining in this time who are righteous before me. You guys starting to see this? This, this small community, this small group. Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. And God looks and he's, man, I'm going to wipe them out. So he blots them out and he's, he's, uh, oh, sorry, next one. And he's, and he's, uh, the animals and, 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 and all those things. And, and he's, we're looking at Genesis 7 and he says, and only Noah was left. What's the word again? Now you guys know it's remnant. That's rem- the only ones who were left. That's the remnant together with those who were with them in the ark. So it's the first place in scripture that you see this idea of remnant. And it's in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. So this idea starts building. In the end of Genesis, we see this idea again, this community that survived. And it comes up again in the end of Genesis with Joseph and his family. Remember that story? And so Joseph saves his family. He brings them to Egypt because of this great catastrophe, this great famine. And the only ones that survive from this, uh, there's a lot of other people, but, but uh, they're the ones who come from Israel and they, they, they come and they survive this catastrophe. And so Genesis 45, verse 7, Joseph says, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. And we'll go on because there's so many others. But I want you to see, I want you to start seeing what remnant looks like, what these people, what this, what this collection and this people, this community of people are looking like in Scripture and how they're described in Scripture, okay? Because I want you to see how they apply today. Look, Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, but you were what? Fewest. Of all people. So like remnant, really, if you look at them, they're, they're, they're not the majority. It does, it does, it does not about the, the, the number, how great they are number-wise. I want you to see this. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. There's all these references of remnant here. In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck him, them down, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. So these people, they're being described, they're they're, they're trusting in the Lord, they're true to God, and when God calls them back, they return to Him. These are the remnant, these are the people that 
they are described in the Bible. There's more. Isaiah 37, verse 31, and I'm going through these fast, I know. So you can take it down or take pictures, as I see some of you guys doing. Once more, a remnant of the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. I love this description of remnant because they're people who like to sink their roots deep. They get deep in, 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 into the word. They get deep into the relationship with God so that their fruits can appear, so their fruits can come up. So this remnant, they're serious in their connection and their love for God. Isaiah 51, verse 16 And I've put my words in your mouth, covered you in the shadow of my hand, establishing the heavens and laying the foundations of the earth and saying to Zion, you are my people. So God calls these people, he calls them what? His people. They're my people. They're a special people. You see that in scripture. Jeremiah 23 verse 3. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them and I will bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Again, this idea that when he calls, they will come. They hear his voice. Zephaniah 3 verse 12, but I will leave you with the meek and the humble and the remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. Okay, we're going to put all of these texts. I gave you all of these texts. We're going to put them all on the table and we're going to look at, man, look, what does this remnant, what is, like, put them all together. Because this is what we do, Right? As a church, we put all these texts together and then we make our case. But here's what the remnant looks like in the Bible. This is a a, a repeat of what we just saw. So the remnant, they're relatively few, but they trust in the Lord. They return to him whenever he calls. They return to him because they're listening to his voice. They take root. They take root and they bear fruit. They are his people and they are meek and they are humble. Is that a description of the remnant according to the Bible? We just saw it. That's what the remnant looks like. That's what this special group of people that God calls his people, that's what they look like. That's what we just saw in the Old Testament. And then I want you to see a special story. If there was ever a story in the Bible that really describes what the remnant is, it's this one right here. In fact, it's so important that it's mentioned in both Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the story of Elijah. I want to bring us back to this story. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 19, and if you want, you can read it there, but we're going to actually read it in Romans chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. Again, this, if there is a go-to story about the remnant, it's this one, 1 Kings 19 and Romans 11, verse 4 and 5. So please, this time, go with me in your Bibles. Go with me in your Bibles, and let's look at there. Let's look at this from Romans chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. Are you guys with me? Romans chapter 11, verse 4 and 5. You will find, again, find this story in 1 Kings chapter 19, but Romans chapter 11 talks about it. And uh, I really love this description of, of this story. So if you're with me, if you're anywhere close to Romans 11, say amen. amen. Look, look, look what verse 4 says. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Even at this present time, right now, there's a remnant. They're chosen because of grace. And I want you to see this in context. So Elijah has just won this great battle. He was on Mount Carmel. You remember that story? On Mount Carmel, and there's two altars, and there's the prophets of Baal, and they're begging their gods, they're begging Baal to like start, you know, put the fire in the altar, and they're cutting themselves. You guys remember that story, right? As kids, maybe uh, you remember that story being told to you, and and then there's Elijah, his prophet, and he's so confident in what his God can do that he even puts water on this altar, right? Remember the story? And he simply asks God, God, for your glory and for your honor, would you please hear this prayer? Would you send down a fire? And, 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 and man, you know the story. And then he just defeats them. What a great battle. What a great victory. And Elijah, and by the way, I had the chance to go up to Mount Carmel uh, years ago when I went to Israel. And it was an amazing, amazing place overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. It is such a beautiful, beautiful place. 
And you can just imagine what that was like with Elijah when he won this battle. But then right after that, immediately the Bible says, he goes down from the mountain to the valley. You guys ever experienced that? When you've experienced mountain experiences, then all of a sudden you go to the valley and man, things change. Queen Jezebel is attacking him. She wants his head. She's killed all the prophets already. She's killed all the other prophets. And he's running away. And he runs and he runs and he runs. And he's so discouraged. And he takes shelter and he hides in a cave in Mount Horeb. You remember the story? And he's there. And uh, God asks him, um, Why are you hiding, Elijah? Which, by the way, the first question God ever asked in the Garden of Eden. Why are you hiding? And he asks Elijah, he said, why are you hiding? And in verse 3, I love Romans 11, verse 3, he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets already, and uh, they've torn down their altars. I'm the only one left. What's that word? Remnant. I'm the only one left. I'm the only remnant. You see, what he didn't know, and God had to tell him, right? What he didn't know was that he wasn't alone. And in verse 3, God tells him, Elijah, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed down to Baal. They are remnant. You are not alone. There's more of you. You are not alone. Don't be discouraged. Now, what's so significant about this, you say? What does this have to do with remnant? I want you guys to see this. Please see this. Here's the significance of this story and how it applies to remnant. And it's this. Elijah didn't know who they were. Elijah didn't see them. He was so discouraged. He was so defeated. He was so scared. And even though he thought he was alone, he really wasn't alone. I don't know about you, church family, but have you guys ever been so discouraged as you look around at your faith and you looked around in the church and you thought, man, what's happening? There's all these people who are leaving. There's all these people who have already left. What's happening? Have you guys ever experienced that? Man, I've experienced that many times. Do you, know what the, uh, do you know what the dropout rate for pastors is now? 90% or so of pastors have, are dropping out in the ministry or have dropped out in the ministry. In America alone, there are way more churches than there are pastors. No one's signing up for this. And I'm looking at even my colleagues, and just yesterday a good friend of mine posted on Facebook. Man, it hits me every single time. Every single time it gets me. And, and, and I admit, I get really discouraged. Another credible pastor, he's dropping out of the ministry. He says, this is the, today is the last sermon I preach for this denomination. I look around and I think, man, what is going on? And I think of this and I think, church family, we got to stop here for some good news. And it's this right here. God is alive and at work in his church still. We may not see it. We may not see it. But he's got faithful people everywhere. And he calls them his church. And he calls them his remnant. They may be a few, but they are faithful and they love Jesus. Not so that they can go to heaven, but because heaven is in their hearts. Just like in Elijah's time, there is still a remnant today. That's what Romans 11 says. To this day, there is still a remnant. There is still a group of people who are faithful to God. They are the survivors. They're the ones who are left over. They are faithful. Do we know who they are? I think like Elijah, we don't see them. We don't know because that's the point. We're not supposed to know. God knows who they are. We're not supposed to know who they are. But God knows who they are. It's not for us to know. And it's certainly not for, uh, for us to judge, right? It's certainly not up to us to judge. I remember having a, a, <laughs> a guy in my church would read a certain quote that said, not one in 20 are saved. And so he would go around prayer meeting and say, hey, there's 20 of us here. I wonder which one is saved. That's a true story, by the way. He did that pretty much every Wednesday night. (laughs) So is there a remnant according to the Bible? 
Romans chapter 11 says, yes, to this day there is a remnant in the Bible. So if that's true, then who are they? Well, let's look at that biblical description of remnant in Romans 11 and in Old Testament. And I love this. And we see they're chosen by grace. They found favor. They found favor and they found grace in the eyes of the Lord like Noah. They're faithful. They may be a few, but they're faithful. And I love this because we don't know who they are. But God does. It's not our job to know who they are. God knows who they are. We don't even see them. In fact, Martin Luther calls them the invisible church. There's the visible church. That's the church and the people that we see. And then there's the invisible church. Martin Luther dubbed that. He calls them the visible and the invisible church. Jesus calls them the wheat and the You guys awake today? He calls them the wheat and the what? Tares. And how do we know who are the wheat and the tares? We don't know. It's not our job to know. One day, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to separate all that. And it's up to him, right? Who is the real and who is the fake? Who is the visible and who is the invisible? It's up to him. It's not up to us. Amen? Amen. I think that's good news. It's not for us to know. This is what my favorite author says. Watch this now, because she says it way better than me. God has a church. It is not the great cathedral, neither is it the national establishment, neither is it the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where Christ is even among the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the holy and holy one who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. What is she saying? The remnant is not a denomination. It's not a denomination. Just because you're in a certain religion doesn't mean you're remnant. It's not about which religion you belong to. It's about those who truly love God. And because they love God, they keep His commandments, a.k.a. they do what he wants they do as he pleases none of us can look around and say oh yeah he loves god but she doesn't love god oh no he really loves god he really i don't think he really loves god god knows that god knows that's in our heart right god knows those things it's not up to us but the actions of the remnant are seen here that they love god they Keep his commandments. But we can't see that. God can. You know, when I um, had the privilege of traveling to Taiwan years ago and then Cuba a few years ago, I'm telling you guys, and I probably see, have said this already before, but I've seen some amazingly hungry people for the word of God and for the presence of God. You know, when I went to Cuba, there was only, in a, in a church this big, there was only two Bibles, one on each side. And they would pass it around. And you should see, as they received their Bible, it was their time to get the Bible. Like, they would just treasure it, man. It was so, oh, so important in their life. And they loved it. And they wanted to read it. And you know, after every night, I'm not kidding you, after every night, they would ask us, why are you stopping? Keep teaching us. We don't hear this. They're not allowed to hear this. It was the first place I've ever seen that before. And it wasn't because we're good speakers or preachers or anything, but because they were so hungry for the Word of God. And the only reason why we had to stop because buses were ready to go pick them up every night and take them back to their place. I saw in that in Taiwan places that they're not even allowed to open up the Bible. Man, people are so hungry for the Word of God. It wasn't about their denomination. It was about what was in their heart because they loved God and they wanted to do His will. And I compare that sometimes to people who and they've grown up in church, they've been in church, they know what to do, they're religious, they're religious, religious. But man, where is our hunger? Where is our desire for the presence of God? Like, we need this in our life. Like, Hinsdale Philam, I think we got to go back to that place where we need this in our life. We can't live without this in our life. Man, we love God so much. We want to do His will. That's what I see in the remnant. So if you look at the Old Testament, I I think it's clear. The remnant of Israel are those who remain faithful to God. They are the Israel within Israel. And we can say that about the church. All through the ages, there has always been a church within a church. You guys know what I'm saying? 
There was, oh, there has always been the visible and the invisible church. Those who hold membership in the organization, that's the visible church. We can see that. But God has always had an invisible church. People of God, they know that God calls his people and they have a by faith connection with God. And it's an invisible church that he calls the remnant throughout the ages. You know, basically, I just summed up what uh, one of our one of our um, leading theologians in our church has 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 studied and, and really packaged for us really, really well. Gerhard Hausel is amazing. He's a legend theologian. And uh, he he has a, a beautiful study that you could see. It's all about this subject right here. And he takes the Bible and packages it into three descriptions or three types of remnant, basically. And the first is the historical remnant. The survivors of a catastrophe. We just saw that in Genesis. Such as the invasion, the flood, the famine. We saw that already. Historical remnant. And then you have the faithful remnant. People who just have genuine love for God. No matter what, they're going to stand up for him. Such as the three boys in Daniel chapter 3. By the way, when they stood up, they were called a remnant. Romans chapter 11, we just read. Just people who have this love for God. They're the faithful remnant. You have the historical remnant. You have a faithful remnant. In the end, and PDK is going to talk more about this next week. In the end, before Christ comes, you're going to see an eschatological remnant. What does that mean? It means that there's going to be a remnant in the end. They're going to pass through the hard times, the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're going to go through the end times, and they're going to come out, and they're going to survive, and they're going to be victorious. The eschatological remnant. But I want you to see, church family, God has always had and will always have a remnant, a community of faithful believers who truly love God, who truly love God. And they love him so much that they want to keep his commandments. It's more than a denomination, church family. Amen. It's much more than a title. about the heart so why does this even matter that's the third question we wanted to ask today why does this even matter again because remnant is not about your title it's about your character it's about your heart it's about your love for god you recognize that he loves you and so you love him it's not about how great your denomination it's about how great your jesus is i love how john piper says You can embrace a system of theology and not even be born again. We got to be careful of that, church. We got to be careful of, of, of lifting up the church so much, and it's all about the church and how great the church is, and that we make Jesus so small and the church so big. It's not about our church, it's about Jesus in our life. Can I tell you the most loving about the most loving Christian man and the most godly man we've ever known, my wife and I have ever known? And this is not to lift him up because, man, he would, he would not want me to do this. But his name, right, babe, is Hector Figueroa. He's the most godly man we've ever met. I had the privilege of, of, of working with him for seven years when we were in Miami. This man taught me how to be a Christian. This man taught me how to love my wife. This man taught me how to love my family. He taught me how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he discipled me and discipled many other young people um, uh, and young men especially. And I tell you about him. I tell you about Hector. Because with Hector, it was never about a title. With him, it was just about his character. And people were so attracted to him because... Jesus just oozed out of this guy. And people were so uh, uh, drawn to that. And I'll never forget this guy. And I I think the reason why I've been thinking about him lately and thinking about him all morning, really, is because just a few months ago, he was found to have stage 4 pancreatic cancer. And uh, by the way, we're taking our two-week vacation this November, and we're going to go see him. Because it probably, unless there's a miracle, it's probably the last time we see him before Jesus comes. But it's never, it was never about him. It was always about Jesus in him. 
And if there's one thing I believe, church family, that God is looking for and that God is trying to raise up, it's this right here. That's what the remnant, that's what the remnant looks like. People who love God so much that they want to follow him and they want to keep his commandments and that Jesus, when people see them, they see Jesus. And when people see that church, they see Jesus. When people see Hinsdale Phil M, I pray that they see Jesus. That's what I believe God is looking for in these last days of people that can be faithful to him no matter what. And they can survive. Even the toughest of times, they're going to survive. They're going to come out with their faith intact because they love God so much. That's the kind of people God is looking for in the last days. People who love him. That's what the remnant, that's what the remnant looks like. You know, um, I believe the reason why we've lost so many people. And so many people have left. It's because we may claim to be something, but the way we live is something else. And by God's grace, that's going to change. We can't say that we're a part of a remnant and we're not living a Christ-centered life. And we're not living sacrificially for God and that we're not living like God wants us to. We can't claim something and not live something else. By God's grace, that's changing. Amen? And who we say we are is the same way we live. And so I always think people say things way better than me. So George Knight in my devotional this year says this right here, and I'll end with this. He says, he says this, once again we see that there is no room for boasting. Yes, God still has a special church with a special message. Do you guys believe that? Yeah. But that specialness represents a responsibility to preach the gospel. Instead of a status symbol of superiority, it is rather an imperative to serve others. It's not that we're better than anyone else. In fact, it should make us more humble. And he says this, thus God is God. He is free to choose whom he will honor with the responsibility of preserving and spreading his message on earth. But having been selected does not mean that they are better than others or will be automatically saved. God has given them a responsibility to uphold his name, but not a guarantee of personal or corporate salvation. So Jesus says, I have I'm the good shepherd, and the sheep hear my voice. And the sheep know my voice, and they follow my voice. Jesus says this. And then the end of of the Bible, in Revelation 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I am knocking at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him, he with me, and we will dine together. That's what Jesus wants, right? I believe right now, Jesus is calling. He's calling. He's calling for a remnant. He's calling for a people that will hear his voice and they'll recognize his voice. And when he calls, they will answer. They will recognize his voice. That's the description of remnant. Hinsdale Philam, are you listening for God's voice? In, 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 in your walk, in your daily walk, in your daily life, are we listening for Jesus' voice in our life? So I want to challenge us. He's calling. Before he wraps everything up, he's calling. And his voice is there, and I believe he's going to speak to you if you listen. Would you listen for his voice? Would you listen for his voice speaking to you today?